And here we are, last day of the Days of Unleavened Bread. For the past week, we've not eaten any food with leavening. For this week, God uses that leavening as a symbol of how pervasive sin can be in our lives. So how did you do? One of the really nice treats that the members from Newfoundland did for me is they gave me two boxes of chocolate to bring home. So I kept them wrapped up, boy, I tell you, carrying those, you know, all the way back home and not diving into them, but um, I wanted to save them, share them with Roxanne, and so we opened one box up. Wouldn't you know it, there was one in there, they call them crackers. It had a cracker center, meaning a cookie center. I had to throw it away. (laughs) Toss it into the easement. Um, But maybe you forgot to not eat regular bread. Maybe the pastries at work that show up in the uh, break room. Maybe you found some leavening tucked away in a spot in your home or car that you missed. Did you remember the vacuum cleaner bag or the toaster? Or maybe you opened up a closet and saw something you had forgotten. But more importantly, did you find any spiritual leavening? In God's mercy, what sin has he revealed in your life? The difficulty we can have, spiritually speaking, is that the more we grow, the more sin we overcome in our life, the more sin we see. And it's not that it's there necessarily in larger quantity, but that we're more attuned to it. If we're not careful, however, that realization can limit our ability to work with God. We become overwhelmed, and that's not what he wants from us. We'll come back to that thought, but I want to read to you a selection here. C.S. Lewis wrote, he was a Christian apologetic back in the early 1900s. You might know some of his work. But he wrote an interesting insight in this regard in a selection, a book he wrote called Mere Christianity. He said, when a man is getting better, meaning spiritually, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows that he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you're awake, not when you're sleeping. You see mistakes in arithmetic when your mind is working properly. While you're making them, you can't see them. You understand the nature of drunkenness when you're sober, not when you're drunk. Good people know about good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. It was a really interesting thing to consider. What he's saying is we're heightened to it. We're more aware of it because we can see even just a little bit at times. But God's desire to see our sin is not so that he can remind us how terrible we are. This is not a week so that we're reminded that we fall short. We're aware of that. God wants us to see the sin in our lives so we can rule over it. This is what Cain missed in Genesis 4. God told him to rule over it, to control it, to overcome it, so that we can eventually become like him. This morning, we're going to ask and answer just one question. Will we acknowledge our sin and change, or will we justify ourselves before God and continue to sin? As I've mentioned, this past week was to be a focus on noticing sin primarily and then making a concerted effort to come out of that sin. But what does God want? We touched on this just briefly here, but let's come back to this thought. And considering that concept, what, however, is at the heart of what God wants us to see in overcoming sin? God's people know that God's working out a plan of salvation. We remind ourselves of this every year as we rehearse these holy days. As we read his word weekly, we rehearse the plan of salvation through those days. But if I were to boil down everything God is doing to the essence, just one simple statement, here's what I would say. God seeks a holy relationship with mankind. Everything he teaches us, everything we are to do and understand and become is really about becoming holy like he is. I'd like to begin in Isaiah 57. This is a great verse to memorize if you haven't already because it speaks to this heart of the matter of what I'm talking about today, what I want us to consider. Isaiah 57 and verse 15 says, For thus says the high and the lofty one, who inhabits eternity, 
God lives in time, which is just beyond our comprehension. He is not bound by the constraints of our physicality. He lives in eternity. His name is holy. And then God says, Isaiah records, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. God lives in eternity, and these are the people he's looking for. People that have a humble heart and a contrite heart. This is what God wants us to see when we're confronted with our own sins. Are we humble? Are we contrite? To know that we're physically weak and being able to overcome sin on our own, we can't do it. Look at the world. They try in so many ways and it just gets worse. We do in our own lives at times. The corollary is that when we would see our sin and then draw closer to God with this humble heart and not pull away from him, then God can work with us. In the instruction God gave to ancient Israel, he instituted a sacrificial system so they would see the cost of sin. That every time they brought that animal, whatever it was, and God gave them different options, if you will, depending on what they could afford. But that they would see not only the cost of that animal, but that animal's life had to be forfeited to cover the sin, to pay for it. That sin is such an affront to God's holy, righteous character that it requires that high a payment. It requires life to cover it. But God is not a bloody God. God is not just simply seeking or fixated on a payment. It's not this strict balance sheet where the debits have to equal the credits. He desires a change in us from carnal, sinful character becoming, to becoming holy and righteous, as we've already touched on. Let's go next to Hosea 6. First of the minor prophets after Daniel, Hosea 6 and verse 6, we see this thought again. God here speaking, Hosea recording says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So why did God do the sacrifices? Again, so they would see the cost that it was instituted initially until God sent his son to die for all of mankind. But the sacrifice itself was not the purpose. Mercy, as he desires there, was more important. He says, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. What God wants us to overcome. What God wants us to become. With all that in mind, then, then let's just look at one example in Scripture which will see the heart God desires when our sin is revealed to us. And the example I'm going to use this morning is the example of King David. King Saul had died. You're probably familiar with that story. Israel had cried out to God through Samuel for a king like the other nations. God gave them Saul. Saul ended up to be a great disappointment. Did things God just couldn't continue to validate. Eventually, Saul walked away from God's Holy Spirit. That created all kinds of problems, and eventually he died in battle. God then gave David the kingship he already had, but David now steps into that role officially. And after that, David then spent some time consolidating power, if you will, taking care of enemies that had surrounded Israel. And then he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. That story is the story of Uzzah. So let's pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 7. David was a man bigger than life in many regards. We can read his story, we can see all that he did, all that he overcame, and it's just amazing that one man could accomplish so much in so many ways, but those of us that are familiar with David also know that he was bigger than life and many times in his sins as well. In 2 Samuel 7 and in verse 3, we pick up the story in verse 1. It says, The men of Kirjath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar the son to keep it, keep the ark of the eternal. And so it was, the ark remained there a long time. It was there 20 years. 
And all the house of Israel lamented after the eternal. And Samuel spoke to the house of Israel, saying, If if you return to the eternal with all your hearts and put away the foreign gods and the Asherahs from among you and prepare your hearts for the eternal and serve him only. I'm sorry. I'm in first, Samuel. You should have spoke up. Okay. I think I'm in the right place now. 2 Samuel 7, verse 1. came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, the eternal had given him rest from all of his enemies around about. As I mentioned, he had consolidated power, if you will, not only internally, but outside of Israel. He gave him rest, verse 2. And the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar. The ark of the God, of God rather, dwells in tent curtains. Actually, that was probably fortuitous that we read 1 Samuel. You could see that it was 20 years without a, an official location, if you will. So then Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the eternal is with you. The eternal is with you. Now, the whole story of the ark coming to Jerusalem and so forth, his enemies being subdued, is secondary. The fact that God was with him is worth noting here. And then in verse 18, to move down the story, then David went in and sat before the eternal. He said, Who am I? This was the same heart that Solomon started out with, that sadly he lost as well. But David comes with this humility before God, and he says, Who am I? What is my house that you have brought me this far? I mean, that, that's a whole story to go back and read right there. David came from a minor family within Israel. And when Samuel came through the area that God had sent him to look for the king to anoint, Jesse didn't even bring David out. He was with the sheep. So verse 19, David continuing here. And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O eternal God. You have also spoken to your servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner, is this the manner of a man? Now what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. Your word, for your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have done all these things. David realized it was God's plan, not his. Therefore, you are great, O eternal God. There is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on earth whom God sent to redeem for himself as a people? You know, look at the blessings we have in this country. That, that can be a conversation that many struggle over at times. Why do we have so much compared to the rest of the world? And they fail to see where it came from. To do for yourself great and awesome deeds in your land before your people. Verse 24, you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. And you, eternal, have become their God. And now, verse 25, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant, concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. And so let your name be magnified forever, saying the eternal of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O eternal of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. David understood this. David knew that God was doing something through him for Israel, through him for God's purpose. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O eternal God, you are God and your words are true and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now, therefore, let it please you to bless the house of your servant that you may continue, that it may continue before you forever. And let your blessing, let the house of your servant be blessed forever. This was David's prayer of gratitude. This is to a large degree why God loved David so much. David focused on God and pondered his ways, meditated on what God's instruction was constantly. He was a rough man in many ways, but he had that heart of Isaiah 57, 15. But power and fame and glory and fortune can change a man if he's not careful. And from here in 2 Samuel, Daniel, or excuse me, David, as I said, went on to defeat 
the Philistines, the Moabites, the king of Zeba, the Syrians, the Edomites, and so we come to chapter 11, 2 Samuel 11 and verse 1. As it happened in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, a lot of this had to do with weather, weather. the grounds would have been very muddy, nobody would have fought a very good war, you could have gotten bogged down in just the physical aspects of mud, but also the uncertainty of weather, and so there was sort of this gentleman's agreement, if you will, the kings did not fight over the winter, but when spring came, it was back on. And so this is the case here. It said, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and seized, besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And we're not told why. Why did David do this? On every other occasion, he was right there with his men. He was fighting alongside them. As it says here in verse 1, the kings would go out. David didn't. Maybe he was just tired. All these years of fighting, all the years of running from Saul when Saul sought to kill him, all the years he fought even during that time, maybe he realized that his generals, his troops were so well seasoned, they would take care of the Amorites and all of these other nations without him. Maybe David simply wanted to enjoy being a king rather than a general. Whatever the case was, he stayed. But then verse 2, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, he walked on the roof of the king's house. And in Jerusalem, it was the common style that the roofs would be flat. There weren't the snows that we would have here that would sit and create problems with leaking. And oftentimes, this would become sort of an outdoor room. David couldn't sleep for whatever reason. He went up and he walked up there. Generally, there'd be a breeze or at least more access to it. It'd be cooler. He walked on the roof. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. A woman was very beautiful. To, the woman was very beautiful to behold. So verse 3, David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone says, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Verse 4, David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house and the woman conceived so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. David now has set the stage for his greatest sin. Not only to desire a woman who was not his wife, but was already married to another man. The really sad thing to compound this sin was that he was, she was excuse me, married to a man who was part of David's leadership in his army, off fighting his battles for him. David then compounded this further. David wanted his primary general, Joab, to set the stage for Uriah to die in battle. But that's not how it played out. If you remember the story, got, uh, David tried to bring Uriah back. Uriah didn't go into his wife. He didn't think it appropriate to disrespect his men to be in pleasure while his men were fighting war. Uriah was faithful. This makes it even worse. Uriah did everything David asked him to do. And so then David actually sends back with Uriah his death sentence. A letter to Joab telling Joab, put Uriah at the front of the battle and retreat and let him die. David wanted Uriah to die so he could cover up his sin with Bathsheba. How many times have we tried to cover one sin by committing another? We know it never works, but the carnal nature still puts it out there in front of us. So chapter 11, verse 15, let's pick up the story. David wrote in a letter saying, Set Uriah at the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. And so, while it, so it was, while jo, Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah a place where he knew there were valiant men, meaning valiant men on the other side. And then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. And then we move down to verse 27. When her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, meaning Bathsheba. She became his wife and bore him a son, 
but the thing that David had done displeased the eternal. This is one of those understatements in Scripture. God was beyond not happy with David. This was going to create great problems. But the interesting thing is God's mercy in bringing David to see this sin. I don't know if you caught it there in verse 27, but Bathsheba delivered the baby. Nine months had passed, at the very least. David went on with his life, not seeing his sin, not even considering it, without any concern for what he had done. His actions were like the leavening hiding in plain sight. It was a sin that he never even considered, never even took the time to consider. But he had gotten another man's pregnant, wife pregnant, and then he had that man killed. God knew the sin was there in David's life, but God was waiting to see if David would see that sin on his own. And after waiting long enough, then God brings the matter to David. He's done waiting. He's going to bring it to a head here. But God does this in a way that David doesn't see coming. And it's not that God was going to blindside him. God wanted David to see it the way any of us would see someone else's sin. That's another interesting thing about sin. We see it so easily in others. And it's very hard to see in ourselves. So chapter 12 and verse 1, Nathan the prophet brings this story. And it's a great story. The Eternal sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, meaning Nathan came to David, he said to David, there are two men in one city. So he starts out with this story. Maybe David thought as Nathan launched into this story that Nathan was seeking the king's wisdom in the matter. So he said, there are two men in the city. One's rich, one's poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds. He was beyond wealthy. Verse 3, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It ate of his own food, it drank from his own cup, and it lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter. This was beyond a pet. This was like a family member. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock. The courtesy would be, a guest shows up, you prepare a meal for him, much like we do. But the rich man didn't take from his abundance. It says, rather, he, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, the rich man. How could he do this? And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. I have to wonder if David was still hearing those words here in another verse or two. He shall restore fourfold for the lamb, which was the requirement under the law, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And then Nathan drops the bomb. You are the man, he says to David. You're the rich man. Thus says the eternal God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, his wives, into, their, into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. I made you king, God says, over everything. And if that had been too little, if that wasn't enough, I would have given you more. But you took the poor man's lamb. David now has a choice to make. He can't deny the judgment, he made it himself. What is he going to do? Will he humble himself and repent? Or is he going to dig in his heels and justify himself? So verse 8. I'm sorry. Um, to continue Nathan's comments, verse 10. Therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me. Nathan speaking for God. And have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to your wife. Thus says the Eternal, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, will take your wives before your eyes, give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with them in the sight of this son. For if you did it secretly, I will do this, God says, publicly. 
So David says to Nathan, verse 13, I have sinned against God. Which is probably the best thing he could have said. There's no justification. There's no explanation. There's no behind this. I have sinned against the eternal. And Nathan said to David, the eternal also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Which means, as I read it, if he had not said what he had said, he would have died before God. But there's still a price to pay, isn't there? Nathan said, this is what's going to happen to your family. This is what's going to happen in your life. There's still a price to pay here. But as David recognized, sin is primarily an affront to God. We've broken his law. We've abrogated righteousness he has established. But the problem with sin is that it's not ever localized. <laughs> we sin and it ripples out. Look at the lives that's, that David's sin touched. Later in the story, we won't, won't read it, that's later in this chapter, God allows the baby to die. I can only imagine the thoughts going through David's heart. The prayer and the fasting that he did, knowing that that death was on him. A life that had nothing to do with his sin died because of him. I have to imagine it strained the relationship between him and Bathsheba. It was never the same again. And then even within his family, you can go on to read those stories, Ammon and Tamar and Absalom and everything else that followed as a consequence of this. God even brought this back up in 1 Kings 15, verse 5. This is the one black mark on David's character, God says. I still remember that. But I wanted to use David's sinful actions here this morning to make a point as we finish observing these days of unleavened bread, not to justify ourselves and say, well, at least I've never done that. That's not the point of the story. The amazingly merciful thing about God is that not only does he not remember and dwell on our sin, but he desires our repentance so we can learn from and overcome it. I'm convinced that the lesson of seeing our sin as pervasive as leavening is, is so that we will come to realize that we are powerless to overcome sin without God's help. David acknowledged his sin before God, and God continued to work with him. To the point where we know from other scriptures that David will rule over the whole house of Israel in God's kingdom. David continued to have a positive influence with all the psalms that he wrote that were recorded. Those weren't all the psalms he wrote, but how we're even pointed back to God through his words. It's an amazingly beautiful thing that God can still work with us when we're broken. But I'd like to go as we conclude, and it's going to be a longer conclusion than normal. Let's go to Psalm 51. I want to just read through this, because typically we don't at Passover. But we sing this hymn, this psalm is put to words, or music rather, and we sing this at the conclusion of Passover. Psalm 51 is David's prayer of repentance. Psalm 51 picks up where we left off in 2 Samuel 12. When David said, I had sinned, David then wrote this psalm. My subhead says, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Did you ask God this week for him to show you sin in your life according to his mercy? That's a hard thing to ask. Nobody wants to be reminded when they're wrong, when they come up short. But going back to my introduction, when we show God the humility of coming before him in such a way, with such a heart, then he can work with us. You ever tried to show someone something they can't see, they don't want to see? 
you know, at work, they're trying to do a task and you can see they're doing it wrong. It's not working. They're getting frustrated. Here, let me help you. No, 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 I can do it. Okay. That's us with sin before God. God says, okay, I can help you with that, but not until you're ready. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. You remember what we did Passover evening, those of us baptized, as we knelt before another member of the body, we washed their feet, and before that, we read the example of Christ washing the disciples' feet. He said, I don't have to wash your whole body because you're already clean. But this washing represents removal of sin. Cleanse me from my sin, for I have acknowledged my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Remember what I read from C.S. Lewis? The more we see our sin, the more sin we'll see. And it's not meant to be overwhelming. It's meant to be a reminder that we desperately need God to change it. It's not that it was never there. We just didn't see it. Verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned. And we'll say, no, wait a minute. Uriah died. The baby died. All kinds of people died in war. Many of his family members died. His daughter was raped. How was this only against God? Well, it's God's law. It's God's righteousness. It's God's holiness that we violate when we sin. Verse 6, you desire truth in the inward parts, that it percolates down in us and becomes a part of us where we don't even really have to think about it. It's not mean we, we minimize it, but it just becomes such a part of us. In the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Do you hear joy and gladness? This is why I say that God doesn't show us our sins to just berate us. He wants us to see that they can be overcome, that they have been washed by the blood of Christ that we can move forward, that we are still part of his body, his church, that the bones that have been broken can rejoice. It's not always going to be this struggle that we're in now. This is temporary for a greater purpose. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. This goes back to what we discussed at the beginning. Isaiah 57, Hosea 6, this humble heart is a clean heart. There's no animosity. There's no agenda. There's no justification. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know, it can be a sad thing to notice how small God's body is now. The last 30 years, it has shrunk dramatically. And when you look at the average age of a lot of congregations, it's advanced in years. That can be disheartening to us on a physical level. But the one thing that I've highlighted in my mind in writing cards to many of you as your baptism anniversaries come around is how many of you have been so steadfast for decade after decade after decade. I have to believe that God admires and respects that as well. This is why we've been called. Verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew in this instance, his sin with Bathsheba, that it could have gone the other way. God could have removed him from his Holy Spirit. And there are times we may commit equally egregious sins but there is, at the end of it all, no sin that God cannot forgive if we humble ourselves and repent. None. The only sin he cannot forgive is a sin unrepented of. We have to be engaged. We have to be in the process. We have to be changing with his help. 
so that, verse 12, restore me to the joy of your salvation, so that we can be restored. God does not show us our sins so we can be separated. He shows us our sins so we can be restored. Uphold me by your generous spirit, then I will teach transgressors your ways. The sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. The God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, else I would give it. Meaning at the core of what God was asking Israel to see, it was not the sacrifice of those animals. It was what those animals represented. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, not a crushed spirit, a spirit that has its attention brought to the surface, a realization like David when Nathan confronted him, the realization that hopefully every one of us had before we were baptized, and a realization that everyone should have when we go through a week like this past week. You do not desire sacrifice, else I would give it. Verse 16, you do not delight in birth offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Because a humble heart, a contrite heart, a broken heart from sin is a heart that God can work with. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices and righteousness, with burnt offerings and the whole burnt offering. When we do what God asks us to do, then he's pleased. Because it will develop within us his character, his righteousness, his holiness. David knew his sin had disconnected him from God. And he didn't want it to be a permanent thing. David knew he needed God's righteousness and he needed God's spirit and able to move forward. David knew that he needed to become humble again for God to continue to work with him. Let's conclude in Mark chapter 12. And I want to conclude here to hear it from Christ's own lips. He, of course, inspired the Old Testament. He inspired Isaiah. He inspired Hosea. He inspired David. But then the Word of God himself came and gave us the words of life. Mark chapter 12 and in verse 33. The scribe had come to him in verse 32, asking him what was the great commandment. Tell him he had spoken truth. There is one God, verse 33, to love him with all the heart, all the understanding and soul, with all the strength, and to love, and to love one's neighbor as himself. All of this is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Yes, we are to keep God's instruction. We're here today because of that. God commanded us to assemble before him, and we have done that. He commands us to come before him to not forsake the fellowship on a Sabbath. We do that. He gives us instruction in what is food and what is not, and how to handle our money and to make sure we tithe and bring offerings before him, which we do. He gives us all kinds of instruction in relationships, how to, work, to love one another, serve one another, but beyond all of that, the summarization here is that we love him with all of our heart. And then we do the same to each other. What have we learned this past week? Did we simply avoid food with leavening in it? Or did it show us something on a deeper spiritual level? Did God reveal to you something you need to know to move forward? forward? 
have we learned to go humbly before God when we see our sin? Or do we quickly turn aside pretending it's not there? God desires for us to be holy as he is holy. May we we remember the lesson of these days of unleavened bread and always have a humble and a contrite heart.